Christ. He is my Lord and my Savior. To the Holy Spirit, who is our seal and guarantee the redemption of our mortal bodies. To my wife, Rosalind. To the continued group in my gun that I love so much. To my fellow proclaimers of the flaming fools of Calvary. And their spouse, to our esteemed deacons and their spouse. Although they were small in number, they still were mighty in spirit. Ushers on the floor, greeters, to all the visitors in the house, media ministry, and to you, the royal family of God, known locally as Lee McKinney First Baptist Church. It is again a privilege and a pleasure that I can stand before you on this, the 23rd day of September, and share with you what God has given me to share on this day. If you would be so kind. Turn to the epistle of James in the New Testament, the fourth chapter. Our reading will begin at verse 7 and conclude at verse 10. It is our desire that everyone who is physically able would adhere to how they read the word in Scripture where they stood as the reading took place. Right. Praise the Lord. In James chapter 4, beginning with verse 7, I will be reading to you from the New King James translation. The Word of God says the following, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil. So it will happen, y'all, and he will flee from it. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you. We'll use for something for this morning. Withholding nothing, all right. I surrender all to Jesus. You may be seen. Withholding nothing, I surrender all to Jesus. Father God, right now, submission isn't a popular subject, but it's a necessary one if we want to please you. If we're going to be in your presence, if we're going to receive the best from you, it's a necessity. Oh Lord, I come to you today and ask that your anointing would be on the words that I will share. Grant me your favor as I share your word today, Lord. Open up hearts, open up minds that the word will be received, Master. And then once we receive it in our head and in our heart, then it will begin moving in our head. In our feet and all of our lips. Right now, Lord, I decrease that you may increase. Anoint me in your presence. Saturate me in your spirit that with accuracy, clarity, depth, and truth, I may proclaim what thus saith the Lord on this the Lord's day. It is in Jesus' mighty, everlasting life transformational name. That I will always pray and always give thanks. As it's the beginning of anything, I mean, a said, thought, done, or even looked at, contrary to your word. But we want nothing to hinder your spirit and your word going forth. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty, everlasting name. Amen. 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 Us, you may be seen. Is there anyone? In the house today, or maybe you in online, who feel like they are far away from God. 
Is there anyone who has some desires that you know are ungodly, but yet you pray to have them fulfilled? You ain't got to say that one out loud. You can say it quietly to yourself. Is there anyone here today who knows God has more in store for you than just going to work, earning a living, and paying bills? Is there anyone in the house today who is confused, discouraged, or depressed? Well, our sermon passage this morning is tailor-made just for you. The epistle of James was written under the direction of the Holy Spirit by James, who was the half-brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus. This book is considered the Proverbs of the New Testament because of the wisdom that it provides. When one reads the epistle of James, it should encourage you to be a doer of the word and not just one who hears it. James owes us much of his writing on the lifestyle that one lives post-salvation, meaning after they are saved, versus how one lived before they were saved. The epistle of James is filled with practical, relevant, and rubber meeting the proverbial road type of instructions of living out our faith. So with the text of the Holy Spirit as my guide, I'd like to briefly share with you four object lessons. I'm going to add that extra one on there. Four object lessons regarding this subject. Withholding nothing, I surrender all to Jesus. Object lesson number one. Submit to God. If there was ever a time you had trouble following the pastor preaching, you will not have that problem today. Because every object lesson you will find clearly if you are in your scripture. Look at verse 7 and 8. It says, therefore, submit to God. Why not? Now, the word therefore in verse 7, it takes us back to verse 6. So I've got to read verse 6 to you. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, since God is opposed to the proud, we ought to submit to God. The word submit is a military term that means to arrange yourself in the truth under the, under the direction of the leader. Submit is a ars imperative verb, meaning we are to submit now and we are to keep on submitting. And it's a command to submit. So it's not an option. Church submission is a matter of the will. So James instructs his readers to make a conscious, volitional choice to submit our imperfect will to God's perfect will. Too many people are going to miss out on God's best for their lives because they will not submit to physical authority. And listen to me carefully. It is not submission when you ask, when God rather asks you to do something or a church leader asks you to do something that you agree with. That's called civil obedience. It's submission when you are asked to do something biblically based from someone in authority that you really don't want to do. But you do it because it's biblically correct. It's sufficient when you answer the call to go out with the evangelism ministry and you go out and share the gospel in the community. You, it's sufficient when you go out and do it although you really don't want to do it, but you do it 
submit to the Great Commission and to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's submission when you come to shop or participate in our monthly community food distribution ministry when you are able and available because you'd rather stay at home and watch TV. But the Holy Spirit and your pastor just invited all the men to come out and serve with him on Saturday. So it's submission when you come, even though you may not want to come. If you're able and available. Now I know submission is not a popular concept, but it's a biblical one. Submission in America is almost like a curse word. It's like a sign of weakness. But don't let the unsaved world fool you. Submission is a godly, necessary trait. Church, it is time for the disciples of Jesus to submit to God and hand over to Jesus the keys to your secret hangouts. Now, I don't even know what your secret hangout is, but I know you know it. And because you know it, I know God knows it. Submission says, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. The first step in discovering your divine take a made plan, a purpose from God, is to submit to Jesus and to repent of your sins. And then you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We cannot submit to God if we don't first submit to the Word. If you are a disciple of Jesus, let me tell you something, there is no way around reading and studying the Word. If you are a disciple of Jesus, there's no way around praying back the Word. There's no way around worshiping God among like-minded believers, even on rainy days. There's no way around grace giving a tithe or a tenth of your income back to the Lord. Yes. If you are a disciple of Jesus, there's no way around serving with gladness. Look, notice that's a, that's a phrase. Serving with gladness. Because sometimes we serve and there's no gladness there. And, and, and your, your spirit infects others around you that they don't want to come back and serve because of the way you were served. Submission is a necessary trait for disciples of Jesus to live out the great commission of going and making disciples, going and making Jesus known to all the nations. I tell you right now, you might want to get real used to that last phrase I said. You will be hearing it quite frequently in 2019. Object lesson number two. Resist the devil. Right here. Verse 7 B says, resist the devil. And something happens when you resist him. It says he will flee from you. So if you don't resist him, you, you can't expect him to flee. Quite often we attract the devil. Instead of resist the devil. We attract the devil when we don't adhere to this word and do things in our own way. I do it the way we want to do it. All we're doing is attracting the devil. You must know we cannot resist the devil until we first submit to God. Every human being is either under the lordship of Jesus or you're under the lordship of the devil. You know, there is no middle ground. You're, 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 you're either in this camp or you in that camp. You're on, you're on the broad way that's, that, that's, that's in the wide gate on your way to hell, or you going down the, going through the narrow gate and the difficult way that leads to eternal life. There is no other ways but those two ways. The word resist literally means to take a side of it. Now, bad theology, especially in songs and testimonies, oftentimes you hear people, you hear even disciples of Jesus going around uh, intentionally engaging in conversation with the devil. I told the devil, what did he 
to do. Mm. You know, we should have learned something from Eve. Uh, 
concluded in my opening prayer, Lord, I have no clue what this day has in store. But I know you do. You know what's going to happen at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, any o'clock. You already know what's going to happen. Lord, prepare me for whatever this day has in store. That, that is about submission. That's God looking down and saying, now, that, now that, that's my boy. He, he knows struggle with him. See, if you're living a godly life, if you are, are doing what God is calling you to do, you're going to be running into this devil every day. Every day. If you're not running into the devil, that means you're walking with him. You're going in the same direction. The only way you resist him, the only way you're running into him, is you are doing what God is calling you. Also, practically speaking, he said this was Proverbs the New Testament, Proverbs of uh, being one where there's a lot of wisdom and discernment. You gotta have a mind made up that when some scantily clad, curvy woman come into your eye gate, or some tall, dog and handsome. Now Bob knew he wanted a big piece of chicken when he got. 
got home. So the better answer was right. So Bob thought about it in a second, and Bob said, Honey, I'm your new tongue. So, so if there is any movement between any, any space that, has, that, that exists in your fellowship with God, God has not moved. It is a Now, a whole lot of things can contribute to our distance from the Lord. Like a failure to maintain a daily devotional time of Bible reading and prayer. Yeah. Engaging in sinful activity that you are clearly aware that it is sin. It will lead to distance between you and the Lord. Ignoring the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do or not do something can lead to distance between you and the Lord. Failure to assemble yourselves among believers in the house of God on the Lord's day, even on a rainy day, can lead to distance between you and the Lord. But perhaps the biggest one of them all is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness leads to distance between you and the Lord, I believe, more so than anything. I, I, it's one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned in life. Forgiveness is a necessary trait yes. that makes human relationships work. Yes. We are all fallible human beings. We're going to make mistakes, whether you're the pastor or whether you're the person who just joined the church. It doesn't matter who you are. None of us don't get it right all the time. None of us don't say it right all the time. I, I, I just, it, it just disturbs me to be around people who act like they don't never see it. Yes, 
you and God. That's the real you. What you do when nobody paying attention to you is the real you. Because you and I can shut and jive with each other. We can put on the front before each other. We can act like we so this and we so that. When you by yourself, when the test, when the temptation come your way, who you are then is who you really are. And here's a, here's a good reality to a sad reality. The good part is, praise the Lord, he's already gone to Calvary and died for all of sins. So every time that you fail, every time you make a mistake, because we are not all that we are, that we try to pretend and portray to be. All of us have a big old sign over our head. I see yours, hope you see mine. It says that we are a work still in progress. Now, when I read verse 89, I remind you of what King David said in Psalm 51 and 7. Because verse 89, the, the latter part of it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Yeah. Remember when David in the 51st Psalm said, purge me with this eye. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. David was literally saying, descend me or unsend me. Because he wanted to feel pure again before the Lord like he did. Before that passing pleasure, uh, that fleeting moment of passing sin with that sin. David understood. Like we need to understand that water can wash away dirt. It can wash away the residue. Of sinful behavior. But it takes the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. I can't speak for you, but aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus will never lose its power? It's available 365 days a year, every minute, every second of every hour. The text says, again in verse 9, where it talks about the, the lamenting and mourning. And, and laughter is going to be turned in the morning. Let me tell you something. James is no kill joy. James is no grumpy old man. No, verse 9 is a call to repentance. We should not be afraid to express deep, heartfelt sorrow, sorrow, especially when we have willfully sinned against God. Oh, and every last one of us have done that. When you will and ask God to forgive you for real sin that, that when you didn't intend to do it, but unfortunately you responded the wrong way. You didn't, you didn't shod your feet with the, with the gospel that morning. You didn't have a helmet uh, of, of salvation that morning. You didn't have a sword with you that morning. You left one piece of the armor out and you made a mistake. Then you realize that piece that's missing, I need to cry to God about it. But I'm talking about sin, sin, what? A different way. It, it ought to be like it ought to be like how the prophet Joel says it. Joel and Joe Joel or Joel, whichever way you want to pronounce it, in chapter 2, verse 17, this is what he said. He said, Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Church, we must get serious about praying for unsaved people. They are perishing right before our eyes. And it's going to take the disciples of Jesus anguishing in prayer and fasting for us to see a difference. We must bow down. We must stand in the gap and cry out to God like never before for him to forgive and to save. Matter of fact, one of the verses we love to use during shout is Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, which talks about a woman by the name of Lydia from Thyatira, who was a who, who, who was a seamstress. Yeah. And, and, and the text talked about how God opened up their hearts to what Paul taught. So what we should be praying for our unsaved. If you're here and got an unsaved husband, an unsaved wife, unsaved children, unsaved nephews, nieces, etc., unsaved what you need to be praying the Lord, open up their heart so that when I witness to them, so that when somebody else witness to them, that their heart will be open to receive the word. 
you're going to have to pray for a long time. That song we're going to have to pray for a whole season. Praise the Lord that we have the example of the thief on the right. Boy, I, I, that thief on the right gives me some joy. Give me joy. The thief on the right made me pray no matter what. Because of what? That man did not come to know Jesus until it was seconds before he died. So what does that say? Nobody is beyond the reach of God if we keep on laboring in front of them. Keep on praying in front of them. Don't you give up on them. No matter where they are, no matter how bad they are acting, God can still reach them. In the latter part of verse 9, it said, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. The Greek word for laughter is yellows, which means loud laughter. Uh -huh. This type of laughter refers to the revelry of sinful men seeking to engage in their sinful acts. You know, when you're watching a movie and you see the, the villain and he makes that little funny laugh before he goes do something evil, yeah. that's the kind of laugh that he's talking about here. See, this type of laughter, again, it refers to, to those type of sinful people. But if you look in the Beatitudes, the same Greek word for laughter is used in Luke 6 and 25 when it says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You see, there will be a day when worldly sinful people will desire to repent of their worldly joy. And it's going to be a place called the Great White Throne Judgment. But here's the problem with that. When they realize that, it'll be too late. No, the only time that you will not have an opportunity to confess and repent before God is after you die and do your end of judgment seat with the Lord. While the blood still runs warm from your veins, this is the acceptable time to come to know the Lord Jesus. And since we don't know when an accident, when a calamity can happen, that's why there's always this push from this pulpit to come to shop. Come pray for the unsaved, because you never know when it's their day to be called. You will see, there will be a day when these worldly people, they're not going to be able to repent, but there's never going to be a day when the saints of God will need to repent. Oh, I've gone with sorrow. You see, it's all right if I have to suffer on this side of the joy. It's all right for a season if I have to go through some hard times over here. Because I read from Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain. But the fall of and finally, our big lesson number four. God exalts those who humble themselves. Verse 10 says, and he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Pride is at the heart of all disobedience towards God. Matter of fact, a proud look is the number one thing on God's list from, from uh, Proverbs chapter 6 where God says that a proud look is what he hates most. God will exalt those who humble themselves before him. The pattern of humbling and an exaltation begins at salvation. When a person bows before God, repents of sin, and believes in the gospel of Jesus, he is then exalted to the position of being a joint heir with Jesus the Christ. We become a child of God. When I humble myself, I kneel before the Lord, who is my Lord and my Savior, and I pray, 
on back to the Lord on today. Submit to God. Resist the devil. God will make Satan flee. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. I can say from personal experience that if you stay the course, if you keep on putting your hand in the master's hand, if you keep on putting one foot in front of the other, if you be obedient to his word, you will receive the best that God has to offer. I can't speak for you, but I'm saying to God this day, we're holding nothing. I surrender all to Jesus. I say yes. I surrender, Lord. I say yes to your master. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say Let's give the Lord a 